Hi, I'm Nick Maselli. At TD Bank, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important financial issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. Healing begins here. Berkeley College, TD Bank, Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future, New Jersey Resources, Fedway Associates, and by Gary's Wine and Marketplace, creating an individual shopping experience for every guest. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, the statewide voice of business in New Jersey. This is one on one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at it. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of New York City. It is our honor to welcome two very special guests. Taylor Barton, who is a singer, songwriter, producer, and author of Pedro and Pip, and also G.E. Smith, who is Emmy Award winning uh, and Grammy-nominated musician, former SNL band leader and co-producer of Pedro and Pip. Good to have you both with us. Thank it's an honor and pleasure. Thank you. Uh, now, right. two of you met back in 88? That's right. We were uh, on the set of SNL, and I was hired to dance for a Valentine's Day cameo, and GE was playing Stormy Weather, and we were on two different stages and caught a glimpse. That's it. Who approached whom? Me. I went after her. I just need yeah, to know yeah, these things. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. For folks uh, who may not know about Pedro and Pip, tell folks not only what this is, but why it's so innovative. Well, Pedro and Pip is a story about a rock and roll octopus and a little girl scuba diver who meet underwater after an oil spill. And the rock and roll octopus has lost all his fans because the oil wipes them out, and he's found in hiding behind a coral reef, and she falls in love with him and promises him that she can clean up the ocean because her dad happens to work for the oil company that caused the spill. So that is the um, beginning of it, and it is for kids who uh, are interested in any kind of aquatic life or saving the ocean. And for everybody who's interested in fun music, we fashioned uh, the octopus off of Dylan, who GE actually toured with for four years. You told me before we got on the air that this has been in the making for a few years. Oh, How many? yeah. Taylor worked on this a long time. 20, and 25 years uh, it, to where it evolved to today. So when Taylor brought it to you, your reaction? Um, she's always been very creative. But this project, I could see that, that it was beyond just one song or two songs or one piece of writing. She really had a, a, a theme and something big that she wanted to develop. So I, I was impressed. When she, the musical score, music score, who'd you bring in to work with you on this? We have a guy named Robbie Wyckoff, who is the lead singer for Roger Waters' Wall Live. I worked and with Robbie on the wall with Roger. Us and them. And and he is the voice of Phineas and Ferb as right. well. So he works for Disney. Great singer. We have David Broza, who's a, a well-known Israeli artist. We have the Persuasions. We have a young girl named Gillette Johnson. Um, Christine Ullman, who's a vocalist for SNL. So we had a really diversified, amazing cast of people. And then a little girl named Ella Moffley, who was my daughter's best friend, who I was, I was looking for a young girl singer, and mm -hmm. I thought, where am I gonna find this? What and, was it, like 11 when she sang that? Yeah, and yeah. she's singing away in the back seat while we're on the way uh, to a ski trip, and I'm like, oh my God, 
we have her. You said that's her. That's yeah, the that's girl. her. That is great. Sign so, her up. Yep, sign her up. <laughs> so let me ask you the message here, the larger message. How would you describe it? The larger message is that we are all uh, responsible for our planet and the kids being our youngest generation are the new ambassadors to get the word out that they are totally the leaders to pave the way for a new revolution of um, eco-friendly living, whether it is with oil or without oil or solar or without solar, they're responsible. It's for you. What's the impact you want to have? To get to the kids, definitely. It's, it's um, because they're the future, you know? And, it, and this is important, the environmental thing. If I said it's political, <coughs> would you agree? It's political in that people have to be accountable. <coughs> oil companies right. are accountable. BP Oil was fined the largest That's right. fine by the Clean Water Act. And, uh, you know, there's, there's oil spills every day. Some mm. we hear about, some we don't. But it affects. Everybody. It doesn't just affect the ocean. BP yeah. Oil spill affected the entire Mississippi That's River, right. seafood, cargoes that was devastating, that were devastating Shipping, yeah. and the livelihoods of everybody that lived in Louisiana. Quick, let folks know how you, they can get this. They can get this at iTunes and the most um, revolutionary way is iBooks. And Tell I, them about I, iBooks. How iBooks is a digital experience. Uh, and iBooks was the publisher that first brought the music and the text together so that the kids... This is the first book that has this. ...who is working on the iPad, which all kids are now in schools, mm. have the experience come to them and everything is right in front of them. They're reading the story, the song comes on, they click the button, they the hear song the plays. song, they're he they reading the lyrics. They don't have to go anywhere else. The song That's is it. right there. Place right there. Boom. Yep. Your love of music, mm. and everyone recognizes you and your work for a while yeah. now. When did you know you loved music and that you had a talent for it? Right from when I was a little kid. Uh, I grew up with my grandmother, and, and when I was a little baby laying on the floor, she would play Nat King Cole and Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington. Growing up where? In Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, you know, and it was, was a tiny little town then. And uh, I, I just heard that music, and I just loved it. I, I didn't know why. I just thought, this is good. I get it. I love this. This is... Where'd you perform first in public? Well, oh, first, uh, when I was like in sixth grade or something, we played at some little girl's birthday party. That was probably <laughs> the first gig I ever had, but yeah. And then, then, played... then eventually I played at all the resorts and stuff around there in the Pocono Mountains, you know, honeymoon resorts and all those kind of places. And then just kept working, kept working. You knew you were on some level born to do this. I felt that, yes, I still do, yeah. It is amazing when, when people have that talent and they feel it and sense it at a young age, and then it um, culminates into doing really meaningful work. I've been and very lucky. Difference. Very lucky. Yeah, I always, I always thought I had more experience than talent. You know, I, I played thousands and thousands of gigs in bars and any yeah. place, just learning all those songs, learning all those songs, and, and I can bring that experience yeah, when I, I play. talent, too. Uh, real quick, songwriting contest? Songwriting contest. We have a, a contest on my website, taylorbarton.com slash contest. And any kid that has eco-friendly lyrics is invited to enter, and they just put their name, their age, their school, cut and paste their lyrics in. We announce on Earth Day, which coincidentally is the anniversary of the BP oil spill, That's right. who wins, and then GE and I take those lyrics and make a song for them and we will upload it to YouTube. Well, Taylor and G, I want to thank you so much for joining thank us you, on Steve. Public Television. And the book, excuse me, it is not simply a book. It is much more than that. It's a multimedia experience. experience. <laughs> thank you for clarifying yes. for that, uh, Pedro and Pip. We're about to check out some uh, music right after this. Thank you so much. We thank appreciate you it. Thank you so much, Steve. Great.
To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. There she is. She's Missy Franklin, and the, uh, she's the author of Relentless Spirit. Uh, and she is a superstar. Oh, hardly. <laughs> yeah, in the world of swimming and athletics, you're terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, you. Loaded question. What's your story? Oh, my gosh. Well, people should go buy the book and read it. <laughs> so we're born and raised where? Born and raised in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> when did you know that you wanted to be an athlete? Ever since I was young. My parents put me in every sport you could possibly imagine, and I just loved being athletic. I loved having teams. I loved just enjoying it and getting out there and being competitive. I played two sports all the way up until high school, so I've always just been a really competitive person. That's you? That's me! Wow. Little nugget me. Competitive <laughs> swimming early on? You know, I started my summer club team when I was five, and I started year-round swimming when I was seven, so fairly early, and it was all entirely my decision. It was me going to my parents saying, I love this so much, and I want to do more of it. The Olympic track, if you will. Yeah. When does that kick in, that people say, hey, you've got it? You know, it really depends on the person. It's so crazy. Like, you look at someone like Katie Ledecky, who in 2012, no one even knew who she was until three months before the London Olympic Games. And then she goes and wins a gold medal. For me, it was more, I guess, if there is a normal progression, I had a bit more of a normal progression where I went to Olympic trials in 2008 when I was 13 and absolutely loved it and decided that I wanted to be back there in four years and actually have a shot at making the team. And so the next three years, I qualified for all the major national team meets over the summer, which was uh, a Pan Pacific Championships and a World Championships mm -hmm. leading up to the games and then was able to, to qualify for 2012. How much pressure are we talking? It depends. It for depends. You. I honestly think I put the most pressure on myself. I don't feel it externally from my parents, from family, from my support system, and even from my amazing <clears throat> fans. And now my companies that I'm, I'm lucky enough to, to be a part of, they're all just so supportive, and they want me to go out there and have fun and be my best. But I think it's myself that really comes down with that hammer saying, you know, you really need to do what you think you're capable of doing here. So it's definitely been a balance of, you know, using that pressure to to make myself better instead of having it take away from anything. It's interesting in the spirit of what you just described, Missy, you used the word relentless. Yeah. What does it mean to you? Relentless for me means just never letting an ounce of energy go to waste. It means touching the wall and knowing that I have put 110% of my heart and my soul into that race no matter what so I can get out of the pool regardless of what place I was, regardless of what my time was and say, that was it. That was the best I could have possibly done. I had nothing left to give. That, in my mind, is relentless. While competing is critically important to you, mm -hmm. I'm confused as to how important winning is. <laughs> Put that into context. I will. So for me, winning isn't important at all. What's important to me is being the best that I know I can be. And if that's winning, then that's great. And if it's not, how can I be better than my best? I can't. And none of so, us I'm can. sorry for interrupting. How did you get so mentally healthy? <laughs> and what well, do your parents have I'm to glad do it with comes that? off like that. <laughs> no, seriously. My parents have been an incredible support. And for me, I think what helps me the most is keeping things in perspective, which comes a lot from my parents and it comes a lot from my faith, which they're so cute. Look at how cute they are. <laughs> But your faith as well. Yeah, Talk my faith is, is a huge aspect, and I was so grateful that I had, honestly, a full chapter in the book to be able to talk about it and share it with people. And hopefully people that know me and who've been able to watch me already know that my faith is incredibly important to me. But when I get out there and race, I know that no matter what, I'm a loved and cherished daughter of Christ. And at the end of the day, that's truly all that matters in this world. So put this in context for us. The Rio games. Yeah. And your faith. Yeah. <clears throat> Describe the real games and the role your faith played in helping you through that difficult experience. Absolutely. So it was huge, and, and it was so hard. It was a huge test of my faith, without a doubt. I kind of felt like Jesus in the desert there for a while, where I was just being tested over and over and over again, where I kept praying and just opening my arms and giving it all to the Lord and just feeling like I was getting nothing back, and I was so confused as to why he would put me through something like this. And Sorry for interrupting. No, Go good. back and explain a little bit about Rio for us. So Rio was really 
probably the most disappointing meet of my career, which obviously is not ideal timing when you're in an Olympic sport and the Olympics only happen every four years. And I had made a huge decision to go back home and leave college, leave my apartment, my friends, my teammates, and go back with the coach that I was training with for my previous Olympics with. And uh, it was the hardest decision I've ever had to make. And I worked harder than I've ever worked before. I felt like I was in the best shape of my life. And then for some reason, I got there and, and nothing went my way. And it's just one of those experiences in life where you have so much hope for the situation and it just it completely lets you down regardless of how much effort you're putting in and how much heart you're putting in. And so getting through it, I had to rely so much on just trusting that God had a plan and that something beautiful is gonna come out of it. And my favorite thing to, to think about is in having Jesus, I know that pain has a purpose. And so I tried to purpose that into making me not only a better swimmer, but a better person as how well. How old were you when that happened? This is this past summer, so I was 21. Right, so here's the question. Yeah. At 21 years of age, you put that all in perspective. Yeah, I tried. I tried really <laughs> hard. It was not an easy process by any means, and it took several months, and it's still something I'm working through, but I tried. So now come back to Relentless. Yeah. <clears throat> what thoughts do you have? What thinking is there connected to the future, of your future in the Olympics? For me, 2020, I would love to be there. But for right now, being relentless to me means relentlessly loving what I do every day. I think this past summer I put so much pressure on myself and it became not fun. And that's not when I do my best. I do my best when I'm enjoying every single second of it. And so now, you know, I think there's a time to be relentlessly focused, to have a relentless work ethic. And right now it's time for me to relentlessly love my sport again. And that's what I'm putting all my energy into. Wow. Um, I have a feeling that this book can be helpful for an awful lot of people and Thank can put you. not just hard work and a desire to win, but more importantly, a desire to be the best that you can be and put life in perspective. It's ups and downs, wins Absolutely. and losses. And That's the goal. The challenges the goal. we face. Um, yeah. You're helping a lot of people at the ripe old age of 22. 21 still. <laughs> 21 and a half. My half birthday was November 10th, so that makes you feel better. Well, listen, <laughs> go out and get uh, this book, Missy Franklin, uh, Relentless Spirit, The Unconventional Rising, excuse me, Raising of a uh, Champion. We wish you nothing but the best. Thank you so much for having Appreciate me. Appreciate you it's joining us on the broadcast. Absolutely. <laughs> Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, Steve Adubato at the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of Lincoln Center. Recently, I had the chance to speak with New York State Attorney General Eric Schneider about the serious gun trafficking problem here in New York State. Here now is that conversation. The new report by the New York Attorney General's office shows that 74% of all guns involved in crimes that are recovered by law enforcement come from out of state, and nine out of 10 handguns recovered come from out of state. All this with New York State having some of the toughest gun laws in the nation. With us now is the Attorney General of New York State, Eric Schneiderman, to make sense of all this. Attorney General, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Describe the problem of drug, drug excuse me, gun trafficking. And, and by the way, the report is actually called Target on Trafficking. Right. Target on Trafficking is a report we just issued. Uh, it tells us several very important things. First of all, New York's gun laws work. Uh, in New York City, 92% of the handguns, which are really the weapons of choice for gangs and violent criminals, recovered by law enforcement, come from out of state. So the bad guys are not even trying to get their guns here because our gun permitting laws actually do work. Um, we also know that most of the guns used in crimes in New York State come from a very small number of states. 86% uh, total statewide of all the handguns used in crime come from seven states. The traditional iron pipeline states headed south to Florida and then out in western New York. You have to add in Ohio because some of the guns that show up in Buffalo, Niagara, places like that come from Ohio. So it proves that tough gun laws work. If every state 
had a mandatory background check at gun shows as we do because we closed the gun show loophole here. Uh, my office worked with, actually worked with the gun show operators to do that. If every state required a permit, we would have an end to this gun trafficking, which is uh, pushing guns into the hands of criminals up the iron pipeline every day. So it's called the iron pipeline. Why? Uh, it's, that's a term that was coined because we know the guns are coming up I-95 from Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Those are really the states that predominate guns going into New York City. Out in western New York, it's a little different. You have to add in Ohio. But New York City and the suburbs, uh, I was out in Suffolk County last week with a young police officer, Mark Collins, who'd been shot twice by a felon with a gun that came from Virginia. Uh, we add in, in this report, other information, such as whether the perpetrator caught with the gun is the same as the original purchaser. And we found that in only 6% of the cases is the perp the same person that bought the gun in Pennsylvania or Virginia or North Carolina. That's a good indication the gun was trafficked. If a different person buys the gun, it crosses a state line, and then you add in time to crime, it shows up within a year or two years. That's, that's, those are guns that look like they've been trafficked. And now for the first time, New York law enforcement is going to be able to use this data to target, we think, a relatively small number of gun stores in these states that sell a lot of guns that show up in New York crime scenes, and individuals who purchase a lot of guns in these states that show up at New York crime scenes. So, Attorney General, I'm listening to you. By the way, this report is very important, and, and people watching in the tri-state area who want to get access to this very important groundbreaking report, in fact, called Target on Trafficking, how can they do it? They can go to our website, uh, uh, ag.ny.gov slash guns and just look or just look for target on trafficking mm -hmm. easy to find and it's an interactive tool it what does that mean it means that you can pick your county uh say you live in buffalo and you want to look at what the gun movement in and out of erie county you can pick your county and find out what portion of the guns come from where and uh at a more granular level we're going to be able to work with our colleagues in law enforcement to target the specific stores and dealers that, that uh, are responsible for this. But it really does also lead to some very clear policy uh, recommendations that should be followed at both the federal and state level. You know, one of the things that really strikes me is about this is, uh, as I was getting ready for the interview, it struck me that each state can have the toughest gun laws possible, but that does not guarantee what will, what will or will not happen in your state as it relates to handguns, because we are so vulnerable to the movement of guns from state to state. Does that mean it has to be federal laws across the board that every state has to live by? Well, it could be done in one of two ways. I mean, obviously the best solution is for there to be, uh, the federal government should close the gun show loophole in New York. Clarify for that. But it, it, the 40% of all the guns sold in the United States do not get a background check at the time of sale. 40% of the sales. So we can end a large part of that by enforcing a law that rules that we have in New York and that I negotiated in cooperation with New York's gun show operators uh, that you have to get a background check before you can get out of a New York gun show with a gun you didn't bring in. We have a system of tags. This is unique in the country. Right. But name, my name goes on it, the guns I bring in go on it. You can't get out of a New York gun show with a gun you didn't bring in without showing a background check. The gun show operators in New York favor background checks. That's Who fights it? The truth. The truth of the matter is the rank and file of the NRA all support background checks. They don't want criminals or people with mental health problems to get guns. They're, this has just been caught up in the gridlock in Washington, and it's really the dysfunctionality of Congress that is the biggest problem. But the federal government could, uh, even if Congress won't act, provide incentives for states that enact, set up databases like ours. The DOJ does that all the time. The Department of Justice provides incentives for local law enforcement to do things like purchase bulletproof vests for police officers. Uh, you could provide incentives. Uh, actually, as a matter of homeland security, you should provide an incentive to guarantee background checks before guns are sold. We also really should have permits required permits for in every guns. state. Permits for handguns. It's clear that it works. Now, it's also important to know that it is having a beneficial effect in that the number of guns recovered in New York is actually lower than in a lot of states with more lax gun laws. So there, there is a some suppression of gun crime that is attributable to our effective gun laws. But you are also right that to the extent there are guns being used in crime, they're coming up from out of state, and that's something that we do need help, either from other states amending their laws or ideally from the federal government taking action. Charter, General, Attorney General, to what extent do you, in having conversations with attorneys general in other states who are involved in this iron pipeline, to what extent are you involved in conversations with your colleagues in those states and they get this issue that their laws, 
or lack of laws are impacting negatively, adversely, the citizens of New York State. Well, they do get it. I have talked to some of my colleagues because it also is impacting their citizens. If there's a gun store illegally selling guns to someone who's clearly a straw purchaser, someone who's trying to buy guns and or someone get else. them to criminals, they're probably selling them in that state as well as in New York. It's not like these guys are necessarily specialists. Or if, if there's a gun store that has bad procedures, and we think the overwhelming majority of the federally licensed gun stores follow proper procedures. We think that they're pretty, pretty scrupulous about it. We think what the data is going to show us is a relatively small number of bad actors. And it's a problem really for everywhere. If, if they're selling guns to folks who shouldn't have them uh, in North Carolina and some of those guns are coming to New York, they're probably selling them to people who are using the guns in North Carolina as well. So I do think there's going to be popular movement. The biggest challenge is at the congressional level. Do you know there's not even a federal law that criminalizes gun trafficking? There is no law. No. There are laws that have been used to go after gun traffickers, but our own senator, Kirsten Gillibrand, sponsored a bill that did not pass last time around that would criminalize every step of gun trafficking. They should pass that law next session. Finally, uh, Attorney General, tell everyone the name of the report one more time. The, the report is Target on Trafficking, and it's available at ag.ny.gov slash guns. Thank you, Attorney General Eric Schneiderman. Thank you so much. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. Healing begins here. Berkeley College, TD Bank, Rowan University. New Jersey Resources, Fedway Associates, and by Gary's Wine and Marketplace. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.